Good evening, my name is Krista Evans. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight is the second anniversary of one of the worst natural disasters in American history, Hurricane Katrina. On the morning of August 29, 2005, Katrina made landfall as a Category 4 hurricane. Winds reached over 200 miles per hour, and when the storm was over, more than 1 million residents of the Gulf Coast were left homeless. More than 1,000 people lost their lives, and more than 80% of New Orleans was underwater. It was in those dark days that followed that the American people stepped up to lend a helping hand to the victims in Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. Project KatrinaVolunteers.net was started to give those who helped a place and a way to tell their stories. Tonight we will talk to some organizers and volunteers from the Washington, D.C. area who have been to the Gulf Coast. We will also speak with someone who is there right now and get an inside look at the ongoing effort. Our first guest is Randy Bacon, director of Barron Builders of the Washington, D.C. Jewish Community Center. Barron Builders repairs and renovates homes, shelters, and community centers in the Washington, D.C. area. Randy, thank you so much for joining us. I understand you grew up in New Orleans. Yes, I was born and raised there. And so what was it like to watch Hurricane Katrina on the news? Uh, the hardest part for me was seeing most of the places I grew up and I attended uh, being washed away and then on top of that not knowing where my family was. Right. It was probably seven days before I spoke to anyone in my family. Really? Seven days? To find out if they had made it or not. And, and how did it affect them? Uh, everyone in my family was living in trailers for the last two years. Um, three sisters, three brothers lived in the immediate hit area and my parents, um, anywhere from four feet of water in their house to their house being washed away completely. Yeah. Um, so they had all lost everything. So with your experience with uh, Baron Builders, obviously that's what led you to to go down there. Yes, um, it's basically what we do in DC and uh, my previous coordinator, Annie Melman, felt a need and knew that I would enjoy going down there and being able to help firsthand. So she organized it and we went and had a really good impact on it. And, and what exactly did you do? Uh, we went down there originally intending to help gut two low-income family homes who couldn't even afford to get the money to do demo. That would cost ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars. And our volunteers, once meeting the people we were helping, didn't want to stop there. So we did a third and a fourth house. Um, and just did as much as we could in the week we were there. So what many people don't know out there is that every time someone's volunteering, like you said, you're, you're helping out in thousands of dollar increments. Oh, definitely, definitely. And so tell me, um, what was your impression from what you were saw on television to when you <coughs> were there? Was it a true depiction or was it I think it like? got much worse when I landed, even just flying in on the plane. I mean, for miles and miles, all you saw were blue tarps over houses and you realize like, those are the houses that survived and there would be big spaces where there were no homes mm -hmm. and I knew these areas firsthand so I knew how much had been lost in it. Then once you reach the ground, the smell, and this was a year later, when gut and houses like... So, so your first trip was a year later? Yeah, it was nine months later Okay. and uh, when we were working in our first house, I mean we were still literally taking their belongings out the house, their refrigerators hadn't been emptied, they had no electricity gone for that time, so everything was stagnant. The smell on the streets was pretty horrible. I'm sure it was very emotional. Yeah, it was. What was the mood like when you landed and you got there? The mood not only for you as a volunteer, but also the residents? It was amazing how everybody was pulling together. That, you know, there was no rich, there was no poor anymore. Everybody was helping each other, mm -hmm. and um, they continued to do that. And so, th your first trip was uh, nine months after. Mm -hmm. How many times have you been back since then? I've been back personally three times. Three times. Um, but Baron uh, Builders is planning something again, hopefully in the next year, as long as we can get some funding and some more volunteers. And we are getting lots of calls about volunteers wanting to go. Okay. And have you been in contact with anyone since? I any speak to my family daily. And well, on I top mean of that, <laughs> <laughs> on top of that, um, for you. a lot of the people who, actually I was there two months ago and I went and saw some of the people's houses who okay. we gutted. Um, one was an elderly family um, and they're actually in the process of rebuilding now. Okay. They had one of those things, was it the water or the wind that affected it so insurance companies weren't paying if you didn't really? have water damage. So it became a big play on, you know, right. getting money from what organization. Another family we helped, um, they were two weeks from moving back in, and when the storm hit, the wife was pregnant, the husband had a broken back, and mm -hmm. they had one child, and 
they had no money. And so we got a, their place and their rental property, and both of them should be living in it now. So. And what is the impression that you've gotten now, two years later? When was your re most recent trip? Two months ago. Two months ago. And, you know, I still hear from people, uh, well, it, aren't they finished rebuilding? No, they're not. Right. They're nowhere near it. And, you know, I mean, the saddest part is you can't go to restaurants in the evening because there's a trickle effect. There's not enough homes for people to live in, so there's not enough people to work in restaurants. There's not enough homes for the construction workers to live in. So, I mean, the city really is, you know, needing. In desperate need. And so for anyone who's out there who's thinking of, of volunteering or helping out, what, what would you tell them? Definitely do it. Uh, even if not just, I mean, you really get a good sense of what's going on and the people there are so appreciative and you leave with a sense that I've never felt. I mean, I do this all the time here in the Washington, D.C. area through right. Barron Builders and I think that was the most impactful, I guess, because I was from there. Right. I'm sure it's life-changing for yes. everyone. Well, Randy, um, a as you mentioned, uh, he had led a group to New Orleans to help those in need and we actually have some video of that work, so let's take a look. Okay. You can see some of their furniture has been taken out, uh, all their personal belongings, photos. It, it, it's, a real, it's a real mess in there and they, this family really need, needs help in just getting the basic first step in putting their lives back together, which is getting all the debris out of their house. So we can go take a tour. The Baron Builders Group um, is working on this house as well, helping them take it out. Again, this is the FEMA provided trailer. This is what this family has been living in since the hurricane. You can see the water line here, and I'll explain the X. Most of the houses in this neighborhood have this orange X. This orange X means that after the hurricane, a couple days after, uh, authorities from various agencies come and checked every house to see if there are any people who needed rescue and also if there were any um, deceased. The X means that the house had been checked. Now, the lettering, NO, I believe means New Orleans and ANS is some agency. That mean, that's the agency that checked the house. So you'll see different houses have different different uh, letters on it, which means a different agency checked it. Now you don't see it in this house, but sometimes you see a zero underneath the X or a number. If there's a zero, that means that there are no deceased in the house. However, if there, was a, if there is a number, that means that they did find bodies there. Also sometimes on the X's, they also put the date where they, where they uh, checked uh, the house. But we're gonna come inside and look at what's going on in here. So be careful for the flying debris. So we're taking out this house, this demo work right here. You can see there's still some personal belongings here. Shelves, clothes. Now the back is really something that you want to see. The back of the house has been untouched in nine months. They have a child, this was the child's room, the computer, everything. These are all her belongings. Everything is still here. This has been like this for nine months and this family still has not had uh, help in being able to clean it up. All the black stuff on the walls is mold. Um, really devastation. The refrigerator in the kitchen here is like this. It floated from the water. It was turned over like this. Who knows what's inside? We haven't e had a chance to check. But as you can see, I mean, this, this is a family's house and it has not yet been cleared out. There's a lot of devastation here, a lot of mold. You can see all over here, it's completely uninhabitable. You can't live in here at all. So this is, this is some real devastation right here. Um, so hopefully we can get this family started in, in putting their lives back together. To see volunteer stories, go to www.projectkatrinavolunteers.net.
Two more volunteers from the video we just watched are joining us now. Greg Wood, a carpenter, Melissa Frank, a year-round volunteer with Barron Builders and the DC Jewish Community Center. Thank you so much for joining us. I just want to comment on that video. It was pretty impactful. And you, tell me what you told me while we were watching the video. Uh, that was taken nine months after we were there, and that was one of the, that was the last house we gutted. And the family was actually living in the front yard still, and they were too depressed. Sorry. Uh, to go ahead and do anything. I mean, they were frozen wow. from uh, just everything that had happened. So we went in and we started the process for them so they could actually start helping themselves. But while we were at that house, uh, we heard a story that within a block or two, they had just found a body. And this is nine months after, because nine as furniture after. rose and then it settled, they did the walkthroughs, but people were under furniture and nobody had been in a lot of these houses. Wow. Well, thank you for that, for sharing that with us. Um, and I just want to let the audience, uh, the viewers know that we are live tonight coming to you from <coughs> Montgomery Community Television. And we do have a studio audience, so thank you for joining us. And I want to ask Melissa and Greg, how did you get involved in volunteering? What prompted you, Melissa? I've always been into volunteering, and I actually served with AmeriCorps um, previously. And then when I came to DC, I wanted to get involved with the Jewish Community Center and with volunteering and I found Baron Builders and it was just the perfect fit. Okay. And Greg, you? Well, I had, a, had an urge to go down to New Orleans to <coughs> assist down there and we got an email through the Jewish Community Center and Baron Builders and it seemed like an opportunity that just fell in place and I signed up to go down. Right. Well, I'm sure your, your work as a carpenter helped tremendously. Um, yeah, that's what I do for, for my job so it was just uh, very familiar with me mm -hmm. for, for me to go down and uh, assist in the demolition project. And what was it like when you first got there? Tell me what, what impacted you the most. Um, the vast de dis destruction that was there. It went on for miles and miles, it's just square mile after square mile. It, it, you can see one neighborhood and go, okay, well that, that's where the destruction was, but it went on so far, it just was unbelievable. And, and we're actually showing some, some video mm -hmm. of some of the destruction right now, so the viewers can, can get a sense of, a little bit of a sense of what it was like there. A and um, Melissa, I just wanted to ask you, and, and I'll ask you, Greg, this also, is there any one incident that sticks out in your memory from your trip? Yeah, I think it was definitely two incidents, and they're both focused around the personal connections with the people we had that we were working on their homes. Um, one was the elderly couple. Claire and Buddy, um, they took us around the, the place that there, what was their home at one time, and they were showing us rooms that their family had lived in. And this place was where they had celebrated their son's birthday, and over here was where they had the grandkids over for Thanksgiving dinner. And the space that was just like covered in mold suddenly came alive, and it really seemed like it was their home and it was a part of their identities. And you just realized how much had been lost. It wasn't just like a shelter that was lost, it was someone's whole like living and being. Mm -hmm. And then, as Randy had mentioned, when we went to that last place that we had gutted and worked on, it had not been touched for nine months. There were toys on the floor covered in mud. There was a refrigerator with food. There was file cabinets falling over and like molding papers everywhere. And there was the husband and father sitting on the stoop with his hands in his, his head in his hands, basically. And then like kids just playing in the yard that was still covered in just mm. mud. And it just it, it really just hits came home. it hits home that we weren't just there just doing gutting work but we're there also like providing hope and inspiration right and that's something that you can't put a value on and, and us as viewers we're sitting watching the news and it's just it's much different than when you're actually there and I know you had we had talked about a story uh, yeah when I spoke very to you very <coughs> similar to Melissa's experience that um, when I was there uh, I went down to New Orleans to help to rebuild the city to you know work on houses and when we got into this uh, house, it was the, the house that the elderly couple owned. And uh, I was getting ready to tear down this wall, and I saw this switch plate on the wall. And being in the construction trade, I, th I found it very interesting, you know, hammer, screwdriver. Mm -hmm. I, I, I pulled this switch plate off the wall, stuck it in my pocket, and I'm getting ready to demolish this wall. And Buddy comes in, the owner of the house, and he, he says to me, this wall here, let me tell you about this wall. And he, he tells me that the owner before him had a mural painted on that wall of the world. Yeah, why don't you show that to the camera real quick so we can. Uh, and and uh, on this mural, the previous owner was a serviceman and uh, worked uh, in the military. 
and he had put a little flag on various locations wherever he had been on the, in the world and he took ownership of the house and similar to what Melissa was saying you know they had birthday parties decorations anniversaries it and made while it he told personal. me this story you know that wall and house became a home this was instead of just four walls and, and some wood this, this, this was a, a, a man's home and then I, I looked at looked at him and I pulled this this plate out of my pocket and I said would you like this switch plate I took it off of your wall mm -hmm. and he puts his hand on my shoulder and says son I've lost everything I have nothing left. Wow. Well, I, I hate to cut you off. We actually have some video of, of your trip we're going to take a look at. Quickly, if you had to do it again, would you do it again, and would you go again? Definitely. Definitely. Um, when I first heard that it was only a week, I was like, what a difference can I make in a week? Does it even matter? But when I saw the pictures a year out, what we did and the people we met and the hope that we gave, I would definitely do it in a heartbeat. All right. Thank you. Well, first, let's take a look at uh, some of video of Greg Wood's trip. The reason I came to New Orleans was after the hurricane, through the media, saw such destruction, I had a desire to help. Although I didn't really just want to dump some money into the system, I thought it might be squandered that way. So I thought that uh, personally coming down, and I have a background in construction, that's what I do for my business. And I thought that I could come down here and actually uh, put in a helping hand to help better somebody's life. From this experience, I learned that there are a lot of people uh, that have a, a similar desire to come down for no personal gain, but just to help others that are in need. And it's a, uh, it's a wonderful trait for somebody to possess. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm awed by it. The DC JCC does different projects to assist those in need throughout the community back in D.C. and Maryland. And uh, they saw the need here, so they uh, put together this, sent out a calling. I uh, saw that they were putting together this trip and thought that it was uh, going to fulfill what uh, I was had been uh, having a burning desire for such a long time since the storm. And them putting this trip together was a perfect place for me to fit in and come down and secondly I wanted to get in contact with uh, local people to see what avenues and opportunity I might be able to take to come down and assist others in the rebuilding process. To see volunteer stories go to www.projectkatrinavolunteers.net Many of our guests tonight have said volunteering has been a life-changing experience. That's also the case with our next guest, Rick Rectin, who works for AmeriCorps and Catholic Services. He is joining us now by phone from Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Rick, thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Rick, first of all, I'd like to know, in what ways has this changed your life? Uh, many many, many ways. I've always been one of those people that really wanted to go help in situations like this, but either never made the time or didn't have the time. And it's just been, it's been such a blessing to me to be down here. I feel like I've gotten far more than I've given. And, and what kind of work are you doing down there with AmeriCorps and Catholic Services? With Catholic Services, I'm a reconstruction um, person for Hancock County, which was where the main eye of the hurricane came through. And I basically assess homes, figure out if we can rebuild them and how to rebuild them. And with AmeriCorps, I teach the long-term AmeriCorps people how to rebuild homes on teams when they come down so they can lead other groups. All right. And, and what's the feeling you get when you're there from other volunteers and also from residents? It's awesome. The residents are so excited to see you come. You know, they've been, some of them have been waiting for two years now. And they're just so excited to see people coming to help. And anything you can do, sometimes sitting down talking to them, it's just, the, the best part of the day and with the volunteers everybody's so ready to help they just they can't wait to get down here and get started and how many times have you been down there I actually been down for 15 months straight I came down for one week uh, back in May of 06 and I'm here now <laughs> so you've been there working straight for 15 months just volunteering yes. your services well volunteering and then a, a Catholic charity has picked me up in a, in a position also and it's just been it's been awesome. All right. And so what would you like others to know about the work you've been doing and also in case they're curious about volunteering? Well, we still need a lot of help. 
uh, you know, the first wave of workers came in with the cleanup and gut houses and pick up debris, and now we're in desperate need of people who have some building experience, know how to put roofs on, drywall, all the different uh, facets of rebuilding a home. We really still need a lot, a lot of people down here. All right. So if, if they're really interested in coming, a Diocese of Biloxi is a great uh, source on the web to uh, apply to come down for Catholic Charities, and AmeriCorps is always looking for members. Great. Well, hopefully they'll be inspired by your story. We really appreciate you. Rick Rectine from AmeriCorps and Catholic Services, thank you so much for calling in tonight. Thank you very much. And now we're going to take a look at a short video with our earlier guest, Melissa Frank, talking about her experiences in the Gulf Coast. I came to New Orleans because when I saw the hurricane had hit and the devastation, my heart went out for the communities here, and I knew they needed help. And not just even the help of someone to come and get their houses, but the hope that people did still care and they weren't forgotten about by the rest of the nation. And I'd wanted to come down sooner, but because of job and work, I couldn't get down. And then I saw the DCJCC was leading a trip here, and it seemed like the perfect opportunity to come down with my DC community to help another community that was in need of hope and rebuilding. And I think living in the nation's capital, we get bombarded with news every day, and we never know what's been sensationalized and what's accurate. So really coming down here and seeing really what happened and the massive amount of devastation, as well as how much and little has been done since it happened about nine months ago, and that people are still needed down here. And that when you look at just the houses we worked at individually, you're like, wow, that's a mass amount of devastation. But then when you realize that house is located on a street that's almost utterly abandoned, and it's like a ghost town, your heart goes out, and you just realize how many more years it's going to take for the rebuilding, for the, everything to return to what it once was. And just like neither of us had real experience before in building anything or in demolition, saying that if we could do it, they can do it, and to really encourage people to get involved and to continue supporting what's going on here in the efforts. I think very highly of what the DCJCC does, how they organize the community, and just not for Jewish members, but Jewish and non-Jewish alike, and they're just such a great presence, and they have a slogan, they're called Center in the City, and I really believe that. To see volunteer stories, go to www projectkatrinavolunteers.net. Although it's been two years since the winds of Katrina died and the floodwaters receded, the need for help continues, and it's not just for humans. Animals and shelters are still in need of relief. Stray cats and dogs continue to wander the streets, and now those animals are producing a second generation of homeless animals. And joining us now live by phone is Scotland Hazley, executive director of the Washington Animal Rescue League. The league just <coughs> completed its 10th animal rescue mission to the Gulf Coast. Scotland, I want to thank you for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks okay, for great. having me. Okay, great. Well, tell me a little bit about the missions and what you do. Well, um, I run the Washington Animal Rescue League here in Washington, D.C. We are a very large operation. We house about 400 animals at any given time. And we take these animals, these compromised animals, these traumatized animals, in from as strays or surrenders. We work with shelters in our area and beyond, and we take these animals in and we give them the medical care that they need. Uh, many of them have never received compassion or love, so we provide them with that, and we find them permanent loving homes. How many animals would you say you've rescued over, over your 10 missions? Uh, we have, well, today was 100. We brought 100 in, animals in today from uh, wow. three different shelters in the New Orleans area. Um, during the time of Katrina, you know, we were there about five days after the levees broke, and our rescue team rescued about 1,000 animals um, for the next six weeks from rooftops, floodwaters, and obviously trapped in houses. And, and so, in all, we've uh, rescued 1,000 and transported 300 total. Wow. What's been your biggest challenge there? Um, you know, finding the, the finances and the resources to get down there. Um, it, it's taxing. It takes a hit. It's, you know, we take these animals in, and, and many of them are heart, the dogs are heartworm positive or they have other medical needs. So we're estimating that each animal that we pull in from New Orleans is costing the organization about $1,000. You know... You know, fewer people are in the city, um, but the animal population is increasing. Therefore, the number of animals entering the shelter is higher, and the number of adoptions are lower. So right. These shelters are bursting out at the seams on a regular basis. Well, One of the three shelters we pulled from over the past couple of days takes in uh, roughly 80 animals a day. They euthanize roughly 80 animals a day. Wow. Well, it sounds like you've done a lot of work, and uh, there's <coughs> still a lot of work to be done. I appreciate you calling in tonight. 
And joining our show, Scotland Hazley from the Washington Animal Rescue League. Again, thank you for calling in and thanks. sharing your insight. Oh, thanks for having me. And we have another guest on set with us. Thank you so much. We have Jennifer Farland with Fannie Mae, an organization that has already poured funds and money into, funds and people rather, into the rebuilding efforts. Jennifer will lead more groups to the Gulf Coast area soon. So Jennifer, thank you, thank uh, you. for joining us. And tell us a little bit about what your groups have been doing down there and how many times you've gone down or your groups have gone down. Sure. Well, it almost started immediately after the um, hurricanes of 2005. Pretty soon after that, our employees, um, we quickly saw really how compassionate they are, and they immediately voiced their concern to, uh, the, to the heads of the company, up to the CEO, that they wanted to personally help in a very hands-on way. Right. Um, our CEO took that call and listened to that very intently and, and, and took action. and put in a policy in place that enabled our employees to take a week of paid volunteer leave, which was unheard of and new wow. for our company to actually take time off, get paid, to go down to the Gulf. It really sent a huge message to our employees about how important this was mm -hmm. and that it's the right thing to do and that if you can take the time to go and do it and that we support you. So since then, we have to date, we've done 15 weeks in the Gulf. We've had over 1,300 employee yeah. volunteers go. Um, we have built to date six playgrounds, three more to go. Um, a lot of work. Lots of work. Well, you know, I hate, I hate to cut you off, but the show is coming to a close. <laughs> and to everyone who's been here, thank you so much. And thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. We would like to thank all of our guests tonight and our live audience for sharing their stories and obviously for being part of the lifeline from the D.C. region to the Gulf Coast region. You can check out even more stories at projectkatrinavolunteers.net. And even though it's been two years, there is still immeasurable work to be done, as you've heard this evening, and the need for volunteers continues. If you or someone you know is interested in helping out, you can contact any of the organization we mentioned tonight, or you can get in contact with your local Red Cross. The need for people helping people will never cease, and we have to work hard to make sure the supply of volunteers and their enthusiasm and dedication remains equally steady and strong. I'm Krista Evans. Good night.